You know, if you think about this as a court case, so the crime committed is something in the environment is causing diabetes and heart disease and obesity. We don't know what it is. Maybe it's just that people eat too much. Maybe it's that we're not physically active enough. Maybe it's a dietary fat. Maybe it's a sugar. To do an investigation, find there's a lot of evidence to implicate sugar. But it's a little ambiguous. There's no smoking gun. You know, we've got some witnesses. And they're always at the scene of the crime. I mean, they didn't, never have an alibi, but the evidence are not definitive. What do you do? The fundamental lifeblood of their industry was holding on to this fact that there's no definitive evidence that sugar is a death-dealing disease. But as long as they could hold on to that, as long as they could keep the evidence ambiguous, they get to stay alive. If the evidence gets definitive, they're done. What do you do? Is it possible that sugar is toxic? How do you even discuss it without appearing that you are a fear monger? And we're talking about a substance that makes people very happy. It's how we manifest love and joy and happiness in the world. And now you go after sugar, which is something that we give our one-year-olds on their first birthday. It's not that simple to know what the right thing is. New research is starting to find that sugar, the way many people are eating it today, is it toxin? Is sugar toxic? I believe it is. Do you ever worry that that just sounds a little bit over the top? Sure, all the time. But it's the truth. You call, you call, you call sugar a poison, all right? In high dose. OK, why not use a more alarming term like sugar is Hitler? Medical doctor Robert Lustig. He specializes in treating childhood obesity, and he wrote this book, Fat Chance. The thing about sugar that's so pernicious, it's the thing that takes you from obesity to all of the metabolic problems, the hypertension, the diabetes, the heart disease, mm -hmm. and likely the cancer and the dementia. It is the biggest epidemic in the history of the world. First of all, I don't, I'm not really the anti-sugar guy. I'm the anti-processed food guy. But to be honest with you, I'd rather not be known as anything, and I wish this problem didn't exist. And you know what? When I started in medicine in 1980, it didn't exist. Or it might not have gone into this field, because who needs this? But, you know, I'm here now. You're taking everything we've learned about healthy eating over the last 30 years and turned it upside down. And it deserves to be turned upside down because it didn't work, did it? You know, you need somebody like Rob for this issue, okay? It's a very controversial, volatile issue. You need somebody in the academic research establishment to take it on. Um, and Rob has taken that upon himself, and he's very good at that aspect of it. So he is, um, you know, he's a pediatric endocrinologist who came to believe about a decade ago that sugar is the sort of fundamental problem in modern diets. He did this lecture that went viral on the internet. Probably got now about four million hits. Well, he's got this very compelling lecture style. You wouldn't think twice about not giving your kid a Budweiser, but you don't think twice about giving your kid a can of Coke. Scientists get nervous with that kind of uh, certainty that he represents. It's not um, consistent with what you really want in scientists, where you want them to be more aware of the uncertainties and discuss the holes in the data and the negative evidence again. But, um, but you need somebody like Rob. You need him out there saying what he's saying and forcing the issue.
You may have all heard that in 2011, the UN General Assembly announced that non-communicable disease, that is heart disease, diabetes, cancer, dementia, is now a bigger problem for the developing world, not just the developed world. Everybody knew that we had a problem, but now African countries, Asian countries, India, disaster, is now a bigger problem for them than is acute infectious disease, including HIV. What happened? Why is everybody in trouble now, all at once, all over the world? Here's what's happened to your food over the last 30 years. 1982 to 2012, meats down 10% because we were all told to go low fat. Fruits and vegetables, exactly the same. We're all told, we don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. You know what? We're eating just as much as we always did. And finally, processed foods and sweets, 11.6, 22.9%, a doubling in the span of 30 years. That's where the food dollars have gone. And as we've allowed it, we've gotten sicker and sicker. Of all the packaged foods in the grocery store, 74% of them are spiked with added sugar. Salad dressing, barbecue sauce, tomato sauce, hamburger buns, hamburger meat, all sorts of things. Also, there are 56 names for sugar. Sucrose, table sugar, cane sugar, beet sugar, high fructose corn syrup, agave, maple syrup, honey. So the food industry can hide the sugar that they add to any given food in plain sight because no one knows what they are. Bottom line, they're all the same. Gallery for calorie, gram for gram, ounce for ounce, they're all the same. And they all do the exact same thing, and they all overload your liver, and they all cause liver fat accumulation when consumed in excess. Now, remember, it's about excess. It's not about, quote, moderation. So then you have to define, what's moderation? Moderation is six to nine teaspoons of added sugar per day. That's moderation. That's what the American Heart Association says. The World Health Organization just said up to 12 teaspoons of added sugar per day. But Europe is consuming 17 teaspoons of added sugar per day. And America is at 19.5 teaspoons of added sugar per day. Bottom line, we're consuming it in excess and it's causing chronic metabolic disease because of it. When I first got to Inner City Health Center, it was a real eye-opener. And whereas in private practice, I might per patient have one filling to do or a crown here and there, my patients at Inner City Health Center would have a cavity in every single tooth or they'd have massive bone loss. And I'd have a 45-year-old person who I'd have to tell them, I have to remove all of your teeth. And that was my daily routine, just tough case after tough case. Obviously, sugar consumption was the root cause of much of the disease that I was treating. I just kept feeling like I have to do something on a bigger scale. So I went to the conference on gum disease and diabetes. They had a keynote speaker who passed out a book and on the drinks page saw that sweet tea had gotten a green light as a healthy drink. And I said, hey, how can you possibly recommend sweet tea as a healthy drink? And you know, I was sort of looking at him and he turned around and very sternly said, well, there is no evidence that links sugar to chronic disease. And I kind of was really shocked at what he said. I started to think, well, there must be some sort of political influence here. I was at my local library, and I decided to type sugar into their catalog. And a reference to the Great Western Sugar Company popped up. It was a company that had gone out of business in the late 70s, and they ended up donating quite a few of their records to local libraries all up and down the Front Range of Colorado. And I noticed a particular reference to a collection at Colorado State University, and I decided that I definitely needed to go up and, and take a look and see what was in there. 
So the first folder I pulled out was the Public Communications Committee meeting minutes. And the very first document, as I flipped open the file folder, had the blue letterhead of the Sugar Association across the top and then said confidential. I was just standing there going, oh my god, what did I just find? I can't believe this. And I just sort of stood there staring at it. And there's just page after page of this big public relations strategy that the Sugar Association implemented in the 1970s. And so it was a very important time when the Food and Drug Administration was actually reviewing all the scientific evidence on the health effects of sugar. So everything during that time period of the Great Western Sugar documents was designed around getting that safety approval from the FDA. And there was this one photo of the sugar executives accepting the Silver Anvil Award, which is like the Oscars of the public relations community. And it was for influencing public opinion about the health effects of sugar consumption. So exactly what I was trying to find, you know, I located in these files. I was giving a lecture in Denver. Why We Get Fat had just come out, and after the lecture, Kristen came up and told me what she had been doing and why she had been doing it, and my eyes lit up. That was how we started working together, me here in Oakland and Kristen in Colorado. There is a growing controversy about sugar. On one side, those who claim it's a harmless source of calories and quick energy. On the other, those who say there is evidence to implicate sugar not only in obesity and tooth decay, but also in hyperactivity and diabetes, among other things. Late 60s, early 70s, lots of controversy going on about the health effects of eating sugar, and it's so similar to today. It's actually pretty incredible the same debates, the same questions, even the same research. So much so that the industry felt very strongly they needed a very comprehensive public relations campaign to impact public opinion. And imagine you're the sugar industry. So you're the head of the Sugar Association, and it's your job to assess all this, decide what to do. The sugar industries and the food industry give you money to make these kinds of decisions. And they hire a public relations firm to put together a plan for them. And then the plan is to make sure there's never a consensus. It was really an international effort right from the beginning. US, Canada, Cuba, Haiti, initially. In the late 60s, the Sugar Research Foundation changed their name to become the International Sugar Research Foundation, which reflected the fact that the sugar industry was being threatened on an international scale. So now we have England, Australia, South Africa, France, you know, Belgium, all coming together to have the same message. It's not to say one way or the other sugar causes disease. They need to keep it not quite clear so that policymakers can't definitively say sugar causes disease. They just have to keep it muddy. Back with us on this weekend's edition of This Week in Agribusiness from the Sugar Association, Andy Briscoe. How's the climate these days in Washington for your industry? You know, it's always tough. Uh, under the new, new administration, obviously, the public health community folks have come out of the woodwork and, and certainly targeting sugar to some extent. For all of the bashing and complaining that there is about sugar, it, it still remains a crucial component in our diets, doesn't you, it? You know, sugar is an important uh, uh, component of, of a balanced diet and a healthy lifestyle. Uh, everything in moderation, as we say, it's all natural, only 15 calories. A calorie is a calorie. If you eat more than you burn, you'll gain weight. If you eat less than you burn, you'll lose weight. Therefore, if you're fat, it's your fault. That's basically what this mantra sums up to. Well, you know what? I don't believe in common sense. 
I believe in data. And the data say something else entirely. What the data say is that some calories cause disease more than others because different calories are metabolized differently. Does sugar cause diabetes? In fact, studies from Europe show that if you consume one soda per day, your risk for diabetes goes up 29%, irrespective of the calories, irrespective of your weight, irrespective of anything else you eat. Diet and weight-related illness, they're crippling healthcare. And I have no doubt that this system will collapse. There's no way we will be able to sustain our current level of health care with the growing burden of diet and weight-related illnesses, especially type 2 diabetes, which really, the, the cost of that is already staggering, and we're just at the tip of our iceberg. I don't think people have had an epidemic loss of willpower. I think that we are normal human beings living in an environment that pushes calories and sugar upon us. We know that in regard to children and the rising rates of childhood obesity, it's carrying with it rising rates of other chronic diseases. We're seeing type 2 diabetes in kids under the age of 10. We're seeing heart disease in teenagers. And non-alcoholic fatty liver disease really is skyrocketing. You develop diabetes or heart disease in your teens, the likelihood of you making it to that 70 plus year old age, I think is pretty darn low. So I'm, I'm a scientist, and we do a lot of research with the effect of sugar. And that's the first time I came to this school, I was worried that maybe some of that science would be something complex to understand. But I was very surprised to see how the kids are so good at picking up things. Um, I've heard the liver being described as like a vacuum cleaner that takes all the bad things out of your system and then it has to find a way to process all of that stuff. And, um, and so I think that when you have a lot of sugar or a lot of fat or a lot of alcohol or whatever, then it will, you know, it'll eventually overload your little system that's inside your body. That's exactly right. When you start to have some overflow in the liver that you start to make fat, and you do that if you have soda, if you have juice, or if you have a lot of sugar coming down, Sugar is actually made up of two molecules, glucose and one molecule of fructose. They are different, and the body handles these differently. Glucose is an energy source that can be metabolized by all our organs in our body, including our brain. Fructose, on the other hand, is almost exclusively metabolized by the liver. So when you consume a sugary beverage, the liver is flooded by fructose. I like to call this the tsunami effect. As a result, the liver is overwhelmed and start to convert this sugar to fat. All this excess sugar to fat conversion can increase our risk of fatty liver, diabetes, and heart disease. If you like um, made a smoothie with just like just fruits, would that be um, worse than just eating a fruit? So if you eat an orange, how many orange do you, do you eat? One. One? If you do an orange juice, how many orange do you need to make an orange juice? A lot. Much more. When you chew on food, it just goes slow and it takes a while. But if you start to make a juice, you'll have that bang tsunami effect. The relationship between sugar and liver is not a new story. If you think about the Egyptian, they were the one who actually started to force feed a goose. They continued to do that. Now the French take credit for the foie gras, but they were all doing the same thing. They were force feeding sugar or carbohydrate to birds, and that was creating a fatty liver. The credit to the American industry is actually to reinvent 
that industry. But instead of doing that with birth, they do it with us. And those beverages are a pleasant feeding that you don't even notice, but that lead to exactly the same things to get a foie gras. You just enjoy it at the same time. You don't have any false feeling. I've been blogging since 2005. I've got a large Twitter following. I'm amazed regularly at the reach and power of social media. Hello. A few years ago, I received a phone call from the Ontario Medical Association. And it was a very surprising phone call because they were inviting me a very outspoken critic of deceitful advertising from the food industry, to a food industry breakfast to give a talk. And so I booked a flight, I canceled an office full of patients, I got a hotel, I was ready to go. Two days prior to the talk, the OMA contacted me saying that the food industry folks no longer wanted me there to speak. So my partner in the office, uh, he said, well, you know, why don't you tape it, put it online? And so I did. And what would have been a room full of 50 people who did not care what I was saying, now I think the last time I checked it was over 270,000 people had viewed this particular video. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what I think the food industry can do. It's actually quite straightforward. I think the food industry could stop talking about no sugar being added to things. This particular product, it looks a lot like Twizzlers. It says no sugar added and yet it has more sugar than actual Twizzlers. I think the food industry could stop suggesting that grape juice is good for you. It says no added sugar ever, yet every single glass has 10 and a half teaspoons of the stuff. That's the same amount as you'd get if you drank a quarter glass of maple syrup each and every day. This product, a breakfast replacement, contains nine and three quarter teaspoons of sugar per glass. Give your kid one of these a day for a year and you'll give them 31 pounds of sugar. Ultimately, everybody can make up their own mind when they watch the video, uh, but so far, if even the food industry executives who contacted me said, you know, there's a lot of truth in what you said, you gotta figure they know what they're doing. It probably wasn't until about the 60s when we started to really piece together the data that said sugar was a problem. You see, up till a little while ago, up to say two or three hundred years ago, the average consumption of sugar in this country was about four pounds a year. And that's splendid. I'd be very happy if everybody had four pounds of sugar a year. They eat a hundred pounds. Nine the head of the anti-sugar movement was a British physiologist nutritionist by the name of John Yutkin. And he wrote this book back in 1972 called Pure, White, and Deadly. And he said that sugar was the bad guy. And he gave lots of correlative data saying sugar's the problem and we need to reduce our consumption. On the other side, there was this guy over here, Ansel Keys. You know the chief killer of Americans is cardiovascular disease. And he was the one who said dietary fat was the bad guy. And there was a fight going on between these two guys. And the question is, who won and why? One of the scientists that the sugar industry was most concerned about was John Yudkin and how they were going to contradict him from sponsoring research that would counter his research. Anytime he might have an article come out, they would write counter articles. They gave a significant amount of money to Ansel Keys, and Keys shows up in my industry documents throughout the decades. He was Yudkin's, you know, primary opponent. If Yudkin came out with a paper saying sugar was linked to heart disease, Keys would publish one that said sugar is not linked to heart disease. Researchers would say to me, if you studied sugar, you would be accused of being just like Yudkin, which meant he's kind of a quack and he's obsessed. And by the mid-1970s, the world had already divided up into people who thought Yudkin could be right, which was a tiny minority, and the huge majority of researchers who had just kind of bought into the dietary fat hypothesis because everyone else believed it. He said I probably boiled 
10,000 hard-boiled eggs for breakfast over the course of the decade and threw out 10,000 yolks, because that's what we did. You didn't eat avocados, you didn't eat peanut butter, you didn't, certainly didn't eat bacon or red meat, and we believed it for the most part. Oh, I don't want it, you can have it, it's too fat for me. It's too fat for me, it's too fat for me. It's not too fat for me. No food is too fat all by itself, but if you'd rather get your fat and calories another way, guess what? Now there's new Better Than. It tastes better than regular ice cream, and it's 96% fat-free. <laughs> Here's the low-fat craze. Took America and the world by storm. But when you process it, low-fat, processed food, it tastes like cardboard. So the food companies knew that. So what'd they do? They had to make it palatable. So how do you make something palatable that has no fat in it? You add the sugar. So everybody remember snack wells? Two grams of fat down, 13 grams of carbohydrate up, four of them being sugar. So it was palatable. And that's what we've done. And we're still doing it today. I think I'm a classic example of a person who followed recommended Western diet and what happened. Well, we are all told that it's all about calories in, calories out. And I'm the kind of person that if you tell me that little fat is good, zero fat must be even better. And consequently, I was eating, you know, packaged foods, which are full of either processed carbohydrates or sugar or both for a good 15 or 20 years. And throughout this time, I was training probably 10 hours a week of endurance training. And I was measuring my morning fasting blood glucose level. And only recently have I discovered that those morning fasting blood glucose levels were pre-diabetic. And he wasn't even eating the worst of this stuff, you know? Like he was eating plain oatmeal, snack bars, which aren't the greatest, but it's not Oreo cookies, it's not ice cream. And he was pre-diabetic. Imagine people that are really eating the standard American diet. Yeah. He's a walking poster child for the fact that exercise isn't really gonna move the needle. It's all diet. What will your last 10 years look like? The average Canadian will spend their last 10 years in sickness. Change your future at makehealthlast.ca. Here in Canada, we have the Heart and Stroke Foundation, similar to the American Heart Association in the States. And the Heart and Stroke Foundation is so involved in funding. They're involved on boards and selection committees, and so consumers trust the Heart and Stroke Foundation. And there's a program run by the Heart and Stroke Foundation called Health Check, where there's a little check mark that goes on the fronts of packages where people who see that check mark believe that the product is healthy, good for them, and endorsed by the Heart and Stroke Foundation's dietitians. And one of the things they put their stamp on are fruit gummies that literally have more sugar than actual candies. But now they are advertising those candies as servings of fruit with a health check endorsement. Hi, I'm Dr. Yoni Friedhoff. Today, I want to talk about Sunripe's Fruit Source Bites. So $20,000 a year buys them this check mark that goes on a box that dupes parents into thinking this is a helpful product. I don't think products that are 80% sugar by weight, the rest water, a tiny little bit of vitamins, and a whole pile of marketing is helpful. In one serving, these 17 small little gummies, you get the sugar equivalent of a Twix bar. Now, if you wanted to actually get this sugar from fruit, your child would need to consume this entire bowl of strawberries. It's 1.14 pounds of strawberries. We should not be taking nutrition out of our children's mouths by calling sugar fruit. What we've tried to do with the Health Check program and these types of products is create alternatives for parents who are desperate to get some kind of a serving of fruit and or vegetable into their children's diets. If you concentrate a fruit juice, what you are left with is a pile of sugar. You are not left with anything else. And so yes, on paper, in theory, it comes from fruit. The sugar that's in it comes from fruit, but it is just sugar. 
It's one thing for the food industry to try to be deceptive about things. But the Heart and Stroke Foundation, I think it's an abuse of public trust. When you have children, it seems like the world would be a much simpler place without sugar in it. And I wonder if they would be much more, you know, stable, if their mood swings would be much less volatile if they weren't consuming sugar. You know, and again, it's all purely speculation, but they, whatever it does to them, even if it, just, if it just tastes so good that it changes their desires for days, it's just a constant, it seems like a constant struggle. I went on a binge last night, and I ate, um... <laughs> it's really strange because I feel guilty now, like I'm confessing to this terrible crime. But um, I ate a whole bunch of cookies and drank a lot of chocolate milk and um, ate some ice cream. Just, you know, just kept going. I had heard the rumors about how sugar was prevalent in our diet and could hurt us. so. I just felt that at that point that it was a necessity for me to make the film. This year, we can each expect to consume, on the average, over 129 pounds of sugar, five and a half ounces every day. This huge increase in sugar consumption is the most sudden and drastic change man has made in his eating habits in all his 50 million years of existence. People didn't know that. And we were beginning to see the symptoms of diabetes and obesity and people who were doing research were pointing the finger at our diets and especially at sugar in the diet. On the basis of our studies, certain risk factors involved with both heart disease and diabetes are increased when sucrose is consumed. 30 years ago, Sheldon Reiser and I were doing the sugar research and I'm very surprised that all of a sudden people are realizing that sugar is bad for you because we did this research 30 years ago and even at the amount of sugar that were being consumed at that time there were elevation in blood pressure in cholesterol in triglycerides and all of these would increase this person's susceptibility to the degenerative diseases that we're concerned about which are which are essentially heart disease and diabetes when i interviewed children riser it was as if he wanted to state the facts tell us what he had found, and I realized that he was by himself in this fight against the sugar industry. When we were doing the research, we certainly realized that industry had the power and the money to promote their opinion far above what we had the ability to do, and it's very hard to counteract that. Where we are in the sugar debate is about where the tobacco debate was in about 1960. And, you know, I, you can look at classic cigarette ads where they're saying more doctors smoke camels or they're good for your T-zone, your throat. And so with the tobacco documents and the, you know, the sugar documents that she found to show is that they're all using the same playbook. I mean, when I got the tobacco documents back in 1994, I realized they were going to be very important. I worked on the tobacco industry for a long time before I got these documents. And I remember saying, like, these guys are really bad, and, and look at all these terrible things they're doing. And I would get, like, patted on the head and said, oh, well, Stan, you know, it's very nice that you think this, but you are a little paranoid delusional. and. People just didn't take it seriously. And once this information was put out there in their own words, people were A, shocked, and B, couldn't dismiss it. And I think what Kristen's work is on the way to doing is undertaking the same kind of transformation of how people look at the sugar industry.
two weeks ago, a nutrition expert told Congress the breakfast cereals widely advertised on television and elsewhere were often full of calories and not much else. So today, the cereal industry responded with its experts. One was Dr. Frederick Stair, chairman of Harvard University's nutrition department. He said that on the contrary, a breakfast including dry cereal was as good as bacon and eggs, or better. Popeye's spinach does not begin to compare with the overall worth of breakfast cereal with milk, any cereal. At the top of Mr. Joe Fred Stair certainly has a long history with the sugar industry. They started working with him, I think, as early as 1952. The chair of the nutrition department at the School of Public Health at Harvard, how could you get anybody more credible than that? His department at Harvard has been taking money from the sugar industry since, well, the 1940s. And significant sums along the way, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars at a time when that was a lot of money. And then through their PR campaign in the 70s, Fred Stair really became their main spokesman. So they had him appear on radio shows, on the morning programs, to be helping to spread your industry message. In general, agree that there are very serious problems with the American diet. Oh, I disagree with that. that the only trouble well, with the American diet is you eat too damn much, that's all. <laughs> I mean, if you wouldn't eat so much and have a little less fat, you'd be in much better shape. One of the first things that the public relations campaign uh, requested and that the sugar industry did was put together this document called The Sugar and the Diet of Man. So they get Stair to organize it, and Stair puts together a committee of researchers who are very sympathetic to the idea that fat and cholesterol are the problems, and then, you know, none of these are sugar researchers. Then they print out, I think it was 25,000 copies, and they distribute it widely, saying it's not sugar, it's fat. So the first document I found was related to the release of this white paper, and it was preparing the different PR spokesmen in the sugar industry on what reporters might ask related to the white paper. They talked about the way that the paper was funded being an unrestricted grant. And we know by actually looking at the tobacco papers, because Fred Stair was also connected to the tobacco industry, what an unrestricted grant meant in Fred Stair's department at Harvard. It's supposed to be a donation of money that isn't earmarked to a specific project. But what Fred Stair told the tobacco industry was, we'll just call it an unrestricted grant, you give us the money, and we'll make sure you get the research that you want. Doctor, let me play devil's advocate. Sure, sure. and play anything you want. You've been accused any number of times yeah. of being an apologist for the sugar industry. Right, I know. One of the things that those who oppose your viewpoints yeah. point to they say, well, you wanted money for the school, and therefore you became a spokesman for the sugar industry. No, no, I became a company. spokesman for what I consider to be the motto of Harvard University, which is Veritas, which for those of the camera crew who may not have had Latin means truth. There is one fundamental difference between tobacco and food, and that is we don't need tobacco. You know, my goal is to destroy the tobacco industry. We do need food, so the goal is not to destroy the food industry. The problem is that the reason we have all this toxic food supply is because that's the most profitable thing to do. And these big corporations, their job is making profits. That's all they do. And it's true that the food industry has to be part of the solution because we want them to keep making food. But to think that you're going to be able to negotiate with them, 
and work something out, that would be them agreeing to make less money. And they're not going to want that. It's a little bit like tobacco was in about the 70s, when the National Cancer Institute was trying to work with the cigarette companies to make a safe cigarette. Well, the do-gooders thought, oh, we're working with industry. We're cooperating. If you go look in the industry documents, the industry was saying, like, ooh, 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 look what we're pulling the wool over their eyes. We're gathering intelligence about what they're doing. And, and you know, it was a disaster. And right now, some of the major thought leaders and foundation funders are still taking this view that, well, we could work with them. We'll all be partners. Ain't going to happen. Welcome, everyone. With almost 9,000 members, we are actually the largest professional obesity organization of any country that I know of. Um, our city was named the fattest city in America. Okay. Um, so, we're so, just so what's the name of your city again? Corpus Christi, Texas. Corp Corpus Christi, Texas, the fattest city in America. All right. Yes, sir. Okay, and then um, what happened? People work in so many different areas of obesity. It is bringing that whole community together that I think will ultimately make the difference. It's not going to be, you know, people standing up and pointing fingers and saying, I have the answer. Uh, because I often say if, uh, you know, anybody who thinks they have the answer has not even understood the question. There have been three summits now for the Canadian Obesity Network, and each of them have been sponsored in part by industry. But this is certainly the first conference where a fast food company and a sugar sweetened beverage company have sponsored the summit. The Canadian Obesity Network was created by Industry Canada and the mandate of the network has always been to engage industry. Uh, except that we've had a very hard time engaging industry because for a long time obesity was a four letter word. Now they're here. We know what their agenda is. A company that's here because they want to sell more product, I know exactly what their reason for being in the room is. It's a little tight up here, almost fell off there. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I'm supposed to disclose uh, McDonald's Corporation's financial contribution to the Con Summit in the amount of $10,000, I believe. A lot of people this morning have said to me, why are you here? And gee, it's awfully courageous of you to be here. Um, I don't think it's courageous at all. We do this an awful lot. Canadian Obesity Network has become the voice of obesity in Canada, where they help to shape public policy and they help to shape public opinion through their interactions with the media. I think that we can't simply fall back on the, well, we were created by industry for industry, this is a network, because it's so much more. And so the food industry, I think in many cases, this is their approach to weight management. Um, they market food very heavily, and then they tell you to exercise and eat in moderation, and it is as simple as that. And then sometimes we'll have, and I put this in for Richard's benefit, um, this is the snack size McFlurry, where this snack uh, has the caloric equivalent of a Snickers bar dissolved in a 12-ounce can of Coca-Cola and has about 15 teaspoons of sugar, and yet it is labeled as a snack. That's one hell of a snack. I don't see how you could solve this problem by simply pointing fingers and, you know, saying, you know, it's their fault. If you would just put Yoni up there telling people what he thinks the problem is and what the solutions are and not give the opportunity to the other side, this would be a complete waste of time. We don't have all the answers. We're a burger and fries and a salad and low-fat parfait company, but we have a lot to learn. <laughs> If the Canadian Obesity Network is reliant on dollars flowing in from the food industry, there's a great deal less likelihood that they will be as forceful shaping opinion or policy negative for those industries who are funding them. And the Canadian Beverage Association and Coca-Cola is a great example. You know, this is an area that is ripe for change, whether it's taxation or regulations. This is on the table. And I would be shocked if anything formative was championed by the Canadian Obesity Network now that they are firmly in bed with the Beverage Association and Coca-Cola.
the afternoon symposium hosted by Coca-Cola, you know, it's up to them to decide who they want, what, what their agenda is, who their speaker is going to be, and what they're going to say. It's not something the Canadian Obesity Network identifies with or would say that, you know, we support, because it's not up to us to support any position. The job of the Obesity Network is to provide the forum, but ultimately it's totally up to the sponsor. Any time the industry has offered to voluntarily regulate itself, it has basically caused nothing but disaster. Whether it be seat belts, whether it be tobacco, whether it be pollution, industry has a vested interest in not allowing itself to be regulated. Basically, I went to law school to learn the tobacco playbook. What worked, what didn't, why didn't it? All of these things are relevant to this what current this fight. Is. 26% of diabetes in America today is explained by sugar and sugar alone, nothing else. Is this widely accepted across the scientific community? Of course community? not. <laughs> is anything <laughs> widely accepted across the medical community? This is very new. This just came out in the end of <clears throat> February. Uh, but it has been embraced by a lot of scientists. Obviously, there are a lot of people who work on the other side who have not embraced it. We really have to think about, ask the question, how is it that in 2013, we're still debating whether there's a relationship between sugar consumption and diabetes. And this reminds me a lot of the tobacco discussion where you had tobacco executives sitting in front of Congress saying one after the other, tobacco has no relationship to addiction. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I too believe that nicotine is not addictive. The fact is, we still don't have the seminal proof, even for tobacco and lung cancer today, that the tobacco industry called for. That is, a randomized control trial. Well, you know what? That would be pretty unethical. Getting a group of naive people to start smoking for 20 years and seeing whether or not they got lung cancer. Uh, you, you tell me how you're going to get that study done. Well, they would like us to do the same thing with sugar. They want us to basically take a group of naive young adults, okay, and divide them up into people who consume too much versus those who don't, watch everything they eat for the next 50 years, and see if they get heart disease and diabetes. Now, how are you going to do that? You've got to look at where in the debate you are. And the issue isn't so much the scientific facts, because those are coming together. The issue is the credibility of the people attacking the science, and the issue is about manipulation of the process. In Washington today, a coalition of health and consumer groups asked the Food and Drug Administration to put a limit on the amount of sugar allowed in breakfast cereals. Their petition to the FDI also asked that a health warning similar to the one on cigarettes be required on cereals which exceed the sugar limit. And there was a lot of movement in the early 70s to regulate sugar that was really freaking the sugar industry out. The Food and Drug Administration was looking at the safety of sugar, and the Sugar Association's goal was to make sure that the FDA concluded that sugar was safe. You go after sugar, you know, imagine the uproar if this FDA committee says sugar is, should not be generally recognized as safe, that this is a potential toxin. You know, you're going after major industries, So this white paper became uh, something that the sugar industry submitted to this FDA review committee as part of the evidence. Somehow, the chairman of the Scientific Advisory Board for the sugar industry, George Irving, became the chairman of the actual review committee for the FDA who was looking at the science of sugar. Talk about a conflict of interest.
And who do you go to for help? So they could go to Yudkin. And now, arguably, they should have gone to Yudkin. And they could have gone to Sheldon Reiser, and arguably, they should have gone to Sheldon Reiser. But they didn't. They went to the sugar industry for help. The FDA just went with the consensus of opinion, which unfortunately were the consensus of opinion among people who were not studying the issue. The sugar industry saying, hey, the FDA says we're fine. You know, you could imagine them in some fancy court case in, in Manhattan with their expensive lawyers and they get an acquittal. They didn't do it, we're fine. There's all, still all the evidence there implicating sugar, but they got their acquittal, that's all they needed. And I think if it had been some chemical that's in 10 products that could be easily replaced by some other chemical, the FDA would have done its job. But you're talking about sugar. It's how we demonstrate our love. I mean, pick a holiday that isn't about sugar, <laughs> ultimately, whether it's, you know, Valentine's Day and Mother's Day and birthdays and barbecues and lemonade and pies and cakes. And, you know, this is, this is what we do. It's our culture. Where does that leave us? It leaves us with this question of freedom. So the libertarians say, wait a second, don't tell me what to eat. Well, you know what? You've already been told what to eat. Where were you for the last 40 years as your food supply was being changed under your nose? Were you protesting then? The libertarians say, get government out of my kitchen. You know, I don't want government in my kitchen either, unless there's somebody more dangerous already there. We need a new food business model that rewards food industry for doing the right thing, not for doing the wrong thing. Right now, they're rewarded for quantity, not quality. So could they make money selling real food? Sure, absolutely. Could we subsidize real food so that we could make it cheap enough for people to be able to buy. Sure we could, but it means a real overhaul of what we're doing. And the food industry can still make money. I am not against people making money. I am against people making money by poisoning other people. That's what tobacco did, and that's what the food industry is doing today. That I'm against. Just recently, the World Health Organization came out and said, this is a big problem, added sugar in our lives. And we should be trying to limit this and change this behavior. The Heart and Stroke Foundation, I think, was very classy. They actually came to my office the day before they made their announcement uh, to let me know in person that this is what their decision had been, that they talked about it for quite a long time and decided that, indeed, it couldn't continue the way it had been continuing and that the best move for the Heart and Stroke Foundation, and more important, the best move for the Canadian population at this point, was to just say, you know what, we're, we're done with this program. It 
And so the Heart and Stroke Foundation's new sugar guidelines are very strong guidelines. They're in line with the World Health Organization and the American Heart Associations and with what science currently feels is the way to go. To have them coming out and making these recommendations, it is a first step, hopefully, to seeing changes on a federal guideline level. Once I found those documents, I didn't know where the path would lead. You know, I was just sort of taking it one step at a time. I was offered a fellowship to come and study at University of California at San Francisco. The goal is to be demonstrating the similarities between the tactics used by the sugar industry and the tactics used by the tobacco industry. have the opportunity to work very closely with Stan Glantz, who's a giant, you know, in taking on the tobacco industry. So tell me what you're finding. Did... Oh, I think the whole perspective that she's bringing is a transformative perspective, and I think it's going to change the discussion. And, and the thing that you need to know is that if you're effective, these guys are going to come after you. We just got to be ready for it and not get too freaked out. To me, the work that I'm doing, I'm going to do it. You know, I have to do this work. History is repeating itself, absolutely. Unless we truly understand the industry practices, that this debate will continue to go on. Sami really came up with the idea to do this expedition. And this is definitely the craziest thing we've done yet. We're rowing from California to Hawaii in an ocean rowing boat unsupported. It's about 2,400 miles or more. We had a very clear idea that we want to raise awareness against the dangers of sugar and help people have like a truly healthy diet. Good luck. Bon chance, buena suerte, don't break a leg. Sammy and Meredith, they believe what we believe. And they're putting the pedal to the metal to prove it. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Well, we're in the fight now. If I never see another obese kid in my life, it'll all have been worth it. <laughs>